Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for, for being here. This is a great turnout. Um, I actually can't see you. There are lights on both sides, so I assume there's a lot of people in the room be, beyond just my mom, so this is really exciting. So we, we get a lot of questions um, on my team particularly, but I know across Amazon, the question being from customers and partners is how do you guys innovate? What is your, your process of innovation? How do you think about innovation? How do you move so fast? How do you bring new products to market? Um, and, and so I'm gonna talk about that today. I'm gonna, if, if you will, I'm gonna pull back the curtain just a little bit, share you know, what we've done, what hasn't worked, maybe the good, bad, and the ugly a little bit. Um, but one thing I wanna clarify before getting started is that this is how we innovate. We're not claiming that it's the only way to innovate. It's, it may not be the best way to innovate. Um, it may not even work for you, but, but maybe there's something in this that I share today that you can connect with. And if so, feel free to, to ask questions afterwards. My entire team is dedicated to helping customers at no cost to innovate like Amazon. I'm gonna show you that process a little bit as well. So our innovation path is built on four pillars, if you will. And I'm gonna talk about each one of those pillars. Our culture and how we really do obsess over customers. I'll talk about that as a common narrative in the company. Um, we really focus on hiring builders who wanna wake up every morning and do really great things for customers. I'm gonna talk about mechanisms. Mechanisms are critical to how we do business, we, we mechanize, if you will, everything. It, it, it really creates encoded behaviors within people to create repeatable processes or mechanisms. I'll talk about architecture, both past and present, and where we're at today and help, how it has helped us uh, to innovate like we do and really push innovation out to the edge. And then I'll talk about a very peculiar organizational structure where we really drive things uh, to the lowest common denominator. Right. So <clears throat> every organization is built on people, right? And you have to give them the resources and the, the really the underlying belief systems that help them be independent innovators. And one of the ways we do that is within leadership principles. So you've probably all heard about our leadership principles. Um, you can Google them, download them, variation. You can buy books about the leadership principles. You know, I've, all, I've been in organizations, many of you probably have, where we have mission statements and they're, they're put in great posters or, or placards um, and they collect dust. Our LPs are our vernacular. It is how we speak. It is common language every day. It is not uncommon within Amazon for somebody to say very specifically to you, I don't think you're being customer obsessed enough. We say it often, let's dive deeper on that. Can we simplify this or that? Um, we talk about thinking big and being frugal and earning trust. It is our common narrative every day I would say there's not two, three days that go by where LPs are not addressed um, at all levels. They are, they are also how we do hiring. Um, it's how we make decisions on hiring, on career development, um, on correctional activities as well. So I wanna look at a couple of these LPs, um, something like invent and simplify. You know, if you look at, at the LPs that, that I showed in the previous slide, you'll see some, some contention between them, right? So you know, how, do you, how do you invent and simplify while diving deep um, or, or thinking big? And, and the point I wanna make here is that um, the LPs are not intended to be harmonious, not at all there's actually contention in them. And that's intentional because we're focused on making high quality decisions fast. And that's what the LPs really help us do. Something like Invent and Simplify is a really great LPA. You, know, you, can, 
you can create um, small incremental changes at orders of magnitude that become transformational, right? But, but an inherent part of, of this is really being willing, and it can be difficult, but being willing to be misunderstood for a long period of time. And we've, we've done that quite effectively. One of the examples of being misunderstood for a long time was, was the Kindle. You know, the first Kindles that came out were, were heavier than some books. They were not sleek. They were not jazzy devices. They had lots of buttons on them. But the point is that that sleek, cool device wasn't the goal. The goal of the first Kindle was to, to create a, a library that could provide any book to any customer in 60 seconds or less. That was the goal. And so we targeted the goal, we succeeded at that goal, and then we iterated on that. And today, the Kindle's a pretty slick device. It, its goal, still today, is one objective. Any book, any language, 60 seconds or less. We make them hardened now, waterproof. I take them to the beach. I take it to the pool. I just got back from the beach yesterday, and I have my Kindle right on the beach. Um, no sand in it. So another example of, of being willing to be misunderstood for a long period of time is my own AWS. You know, um, in 2006, we started this business, and Wall Street really said, this is a risky bet. That was the public statement. This is a risky bet. What do you guys know about technology? You know, what, you're going to need a massive sales force. You know, and, and is this stuff even secure? And, and by the way, you know, could you guys make your retail business profitable first? But the thing is, is we had, we had learned a lot over the years about how to run infrastructure at scale. And we had become pretty successful at it, and we thought, that customers would also benefit from this. And customer obsession being a central tenant of our company, we decided to move forward, even though Wall Street thought it was a wicked, risky bet. Today, <laughs> Wall Street loves AWS, right? Thing is, is, our customers love AWS even more. They love the fact that we continuously iterate with new services, that, that they can go global in minutes, that they could save costs by turning services off, down, or advancing on services, or whatever it might be. Customers love AWS, and that is our objective. Another great leadership principle you hear every day is bias for action. Um, I've been in companies before where, where hard-charging, proactive decision-making can cause tension, but that is not how we operate. Bias for action is important to us. You know, speed really does matter in business. We all know that. But the fact, there's a balance also to, to really understand that many decisions um, can be reversed. So, so how do you balance this? How do you know when it's appropriate to move really quickly, and how do you know when it's time to dive really deep and slow down? Well, the answer to that is, is in the statement. You know, is it reversible? So we actually have a, a mechanism for this. Something we call one-way and two-way doors. So, so a one-way door is, is a really big decision, like building a data center, okay? Or a fulfillment center, right? These things require a lot of study. Because once you go through that door, there's no backing away, right? So we dive deep on those. We analyze them exhaustively. But that's not the case with most decisions. Most decisions aren't one-way doors. Most decisions are two-way doors. They're very reversible. You can step forward, innovate, and then pull back. It's quite easy at that point. So, so we think about these as one-way and two-way doors. And we teach Amazonians that if you have about 70% of the information you need to make a decision, go forward. Move forward. If you're waiting for 90%, you're moving too slow. That's how we think about speed mattering in business. So mechanisms, I mentioned mechanisms are critical to everything. My own team, 
team is over here, my cheering section is going through this exercise right now. We're reevaluating our mechanisms. We never stand on our existing mechanisms. We're always iterating. And they really create these encoded behaviors within an organization because we know, we know that everybody has good intentions, right? You have to begin with that assumption. But people get busy. They forget. The older I get, the more I forget. I get distracted. Maybe resources are shifting. So by creating these repeatable processes, these encoded behaviors using mechanisms, we can lower the probability of failure. So very simply, what is a mechanism? Input, output, process. Simple math, right? For us, we create tools, we iterate on those tools, adopt them, inspect the results, and then go back and modify the tools. I want to give you an example of how this really worked for me recently. So one of the things I'm responsible for in my role is all the intake that comes in for working backwards engagements or sessions. So I mentioned how we provide no cost workshops for customers to apply the working backwards process just like we do to ourselves. Um, and I'll talk about the process a little bit more in a few slides. Um, but we do that for customers. And, and I get all these intakes, and there was, the volume was too much. I, I wasn't doing a good job. I wasn't tracking it well. I didn't have any metrics to know what my SLA was. I had a one-day turnaround SLA, but I, wasn't, I didn't know if I was meeting it. You know? So I needed a tool that I could, I could track the intake more effectively, because there were a lot of them. And things that maybe would get rejected, right? How was I qualifying what was really acceptable and what was rejected? Was it just my best guess? So I needed a strong mechanism to do that. So I created this initial tool. It was very rudimentary. <laughs> it was only solving for my problem. That was the goal at the time. It was to create a tool that I could do an intake, I could evaluate, get some metrics, boom, done. And it worked. All right, spun up some resources, got it going. It was a quick turnaround, a couple of weeks. I had a tool running. So I shared it with one of our um, digital innovation specialists who run the workshops for customers. She loved it. She said, we could do all kinds of great things. We collaborated a little bit. She gave me some subject matter expert input. I made some modifications. We iterated on that and shared it with the rest of the team. The team loved it, gave some more feedback, and this we used this cycle, this the cycle exactly like this, tool, adoption, inspection, tool, adoption, inspection. And we built this tool, and we actually now have rolled that out as an internal mechanism, a tool that we can use where account teams can go in and request an engagement with us on behalf of our customers. We can move that along quickly and create better customer obsession, both at the account manager and at the in-state customer. I did that in a couple of weeks. We iterated on it in a month, and we had a tool working. Um, that's how we innovate quickly through the application of mechanisms. So the hallmark mechanism, and you've heard me mention working backwards, is our working backwards process. So working backwards has a couple of simple components to it. It's got a press release. It's got frequently asked questions and a visualization. Um, the, when we first do this, the visualizations are, are everything is pretty rudimentary, the, the first pass through. It's not expected to be perfect when we start, but it really lets us sort of dive deep on the customer. I'm going to show you a couple of slides, maybe three or four slides. We'll sit on this issue so you can see how we use the working backwards process internally and for customers. So this is a lanyard we give to every Amazonian. Simple questions, right? Well, who is the customer? What is the customer problem opportunity? Is the most important customer benefit clear? You could answer these in five minutes, right? These are pretty simple questions, but you could spend five months trying to answer these questions. Once you have the answers to these, then you're ready to begin the working backwards process. And so here's kind of what it looks like. You know, it's a, it's a press release. Now, when I talk about a press release, this is, this is a mock press release. It's an internal product. It's about one page, very concise, very specific. 
It really intends to put the customer at the center of everything. How is the customer feeling about something? How do they like this product? What's the benefit? Back to those lanyard questions. It's then backed up by frequently asked questions. Those get a little bit more technical, begin to answer some of the questions that you might have had in the press release. But the customer still remains central to all of it. And then the visualizations, as I mentioned, are pretty rudimentary at beginning. But you can see the kinds that we produce in this graphic. Um, you know, we, we create these in our workshops and then uh, produce the, the visualization that really is about the customer seeing, you know, what would the customer look like how would they feel? We create personas within this. We characterize that persona by choices that they might make or representations of who they are to really put them in the center of everything. So this is kind of how it works. So at Amazon, we are a narrative culture. We actually don't use PowerPoint except for in this situation because it works really well in this discussion, but we actually don't use PowerPoint internally. We use narrative discussions. We are a narrative organization. We write. If you don't come to Amazon being a good writer, you're gonna learn how to become a good writer very quickly. We have classes on learning how to be an Amazonian writer. We write two pages, six pages, 10 page documents. So I wanna tell you about actually how this works. So you've heard we're a peculiar company, peculiar behaviors. One of them is this. So if you have an idea for a product or a service and you think you can bring that to market, you want to develop that, um, you will write a PR FAQ. That's a requirement. You will do that. And then you'll gather your team together. It'll be about 8, 10, maybe 12 people in a room. And there'll be pens, red pens in the middle of the room. Everybody will come in quietly, sit down. You'll pass out your press releases. And then you'll sit there for 10, 15, 20 minutes in silence. I would guess at least once a month or more, we do this even over video chat. Do a chat, everybody's on there, and we'll be silent for 20 minutes reading and noting. At first, it's completely awkward to sit in a room with 10, 12 people and nobody's talking for 20 minutes. But you really get used to it and you realize that this is a great tool for thinking about a problem, diving deep on a problem, understanding the variations. You know, who is the customer? What are the alternatives? Does this really benefit the customer? And you've not written a single line of code yet. So what's the cost here? The cost is maybe a little embarrassment. <laughs> but you've refined your process, you've created a great way forward, and, to, and you really started to create those requirements that most organizations will take months and months to build. So let's talk about the architecture, the third pillar. Um, you hire the best people, you train and develop them, and you need to give them the tools to be innovators. Not one or two people, but the entire organization. And that's how our, our architecture is built for us. So about a decade ago, like many, many companies, we had a single monolithic architecture. All logic, all features were centralized in it. In it. Um, teams wrote code against that monolithic database. Uh, there was no flexibility. There was no speed. Um, and we knew that that wasn't going to work. That wasn't going to work for where Amazon was going. So around 2000, we started to really break that architecture apart into um, a service-oriented architecture. Uh, we started creating different um, you know, domain creations, different databases, different options. And, and, and today, most things that you do, even on the website, are individual services even like the, the buy button, your cart. These are all individual uh, hardened APIs that function. So I want to give you an example um, in my own life where, where the aha moment, even though I've been in this business for a while, really where I saw the aha moment of how this is so powerful. So I was getting ready for bed one night, and my house is obviously, my house is wrapped in echo devices and ring devices. Every room has them. 
They're all interconnected. I'm getting ready for bed. Since I do my best thinking in the bathroom, um, <laughs> got the joke, thank you. Best thinking in the bathroom, uh, I have an Echo device in there. And there was an announcement. She had a notification for me. And so I asked her, I said, well, you know, Alexa, what's the notification? And she read back to me a comment someone had put on Amazon.com for a product that I was looking to buy. So I'm looking to buy a product, and I had a question about it, so I made a comment. And somebody then went back and answered to my comment. So think about what's happening here. From Amazon.com, the textual narratives that I entered, the question, she now then notified all the way to my Echo, converted it to audio, read it back to me when I wanted it, and then that wasn't it. I responded saying, she asked me, did, did I answer your question? Um, and I said, yes, and she responds back and obviously closes it out. That structure is this conversion to service-oriented architecture. It's how AWS functions in the individual hardened APIs. And it, the significance of that um, struck me, even though I have a background in AIML, um, I was impressed with that. So um, I got fired from a job once because I, um, I ran a job on a mainframe. It was 3 o'clock in the morning, but I didn't schedule it. And so I got in a lot of trouble for that. I figured I could just run it, right? Um, had I had AWS, it wouldn't have been such a big deal, right? Because there's no gatekeeper. Back then, back those that worked in data centers, there's always a gatekeeper. And the old initial Amazon, there was a gatekeeper for everything. With AWS, there's no gatekeeper anymore. The result is that everybody in the organization is able to experiment, to innovate at any scale. Uh, think about the tool that I developed. I didn't have to get permission from anybody. I had an idea, I had a, pro or I had a problem, I had an idea to solve it. I was able to execute quickly. Everybody in the organization was able to experiment now at any scale, and, and when you're done experimenting, or if an experiment doesn't work, simply turn it off. It doesn't cost you anything. Shut it, shut it down. All right. So you really create the opportunity for everybody in the organization to experiment. All right, let's talk a little bit about this peculiar organization. Um, we push decision making down to the lowest common denominator. Um, we really empower individual teams to be able to make decisions. And we do that in a couple of ways. So we have this idea of two pizza teams. We actually talk about this internally. A two pizza team um, is the idea that no team should be too big that it can't be fed with two pizzas. Now I know, right? Everybody can eat differently and my son can kill an entire pizza by himself. That's not the point. Small teams operating individually with all the resources, all the capability, and all the authority they need. 10, 8, 10, 12 people. Anything beyond that, you're probably getting too big. You probably need to create another team. So this is how we actually operate. The autonomy for decision making is held within that team. And that team has this, what we call a single threaded leader. A leader has all the authority to make decisions. They don't have to go back and check at different milestones for different approval to continue. They're resourced correctly. They have the right people. They have the right timelines. They have the right decision making, everything they need. Now, if they grow and they need to split off, we, we do that. We create additional teams. Also unique within our single threaded leader structure <coughs> pardon me, is that um, we don't give additional duties to leaders. My, my chain of command is entirely over here, and they have one focus. They're focused on digital innovation. They don't get additional duties that comes to them. They drive hard and focus just on that priority. Um, so they're what's referred to as a single-threaded leader. All decision-making is up through their chain. So 
thing is with two pizza teams is they don't guarantee success. But you can't have innovation without failure. Um, Jeff Bezos has said, I think it was 2015, when he said, failure and invention are inseparable twins. Expect that there will be failure. How you deal with that failure is really what differentiates how we do business within Amazon. So an example of, of a significant failure uh, would be, uh, we started out creating an auction market and that, that didn't work, it didn't catch on. Then we created something called Z Shops and that too didn't catch on and now we've created Marketplace. And the key thing to remember here is that we were stubborn on the vision but flexible on the details. We knew that customers would benefit from this idea of a marketplace. And today, um, we have fulfillment by Amazon where you know, suppliers can distribute their products through, through Amazon. So that's a great example. Another really um, significant example of, of a failure with the Amazon was the Fire Phone. It was kind of a public embarrassment. We actually had to write down like, I think it's $170 million of unsold inventory. Turns out that building hardware is really hard and um, it just wasn't what we were good at. But the key here is that within Amazon, failure doesn't mean failure of your career. It's not the end of your future. You're not gonna be forced out of the company, embarrassed out of the company, pressured to leave. The people that worked on the initial Fire Phone went on to create the Echo and Alexa devices. Right. So lesson learned for us, lesson learned for everyone, is that failure doesn't mean the failure of your future. And if you're gonna be an agile, fast-moving company, you're gonna have to have the flexibility that people can take risks. We're innovators and we value calculated risk. So quick summary, there are four pillars that, that the company has built on. This is not a, a show slide, this is actually how we really function. We, we hire builders that want to be customer obsessed. We support them with a strong belief system that is commonly narrated throughout Every day within the company, we create mechanisms, right? These encoded behaviors, these tools that create process, that create um, output. We use them all the time. We have reporting mechanisms, we have tool mechanisms. They're common to everything. Um, I'm a big fan of using mechanisms because I'm simply forgetful. Architecture, obviously the move to service-oriented architecture, hardened APIs, I give you that great story about my epiphany moment on how um, the conversion from the connection between website to Echo and back, or to Alexa and back, really allowed for rapid growth so that everybody in the company is an innovator now. Anybody can spin up resources. You don't need approval. You have an account. Test, play, get in there, break things. And then small agile teams that we function on. So if there's something in what I've said that sort of resonates, there are a couple of ways you can engage with my team. And we actually have other programs that can help with like uh, cloud migration. We've got a great program, uh, cloud uh, migration acceleration program. If you're thinking about moving into AWS, uh, we also have another team that we really, we, we work very closely with um, that thinks about executive visioning. So if you're a decision maker with an organization, you've got not just a solution problem, or a product that you're looking at or a service, but you have organizational redesign thinking that you wanna transform, we have a team that will do at no cost, work with you to create that vision um, at the executive level. And a lot of times what happens there is, is the output of that will create multiple products, programs, services, things you need to implement, and that will then flow into my team. So like I said, no cost service, we use the working backwards process to help you identify a single problem to create a single solution. 
Um, you might rack and stack in the beginning, multiple problems, but we focus on one-to-one -one and get you to a solution as quickly as possible. All right, so if you have questions about any of that or anything you heard, feel free to catch me if I can't answer it. My team is over here. Any questions? Any questions at all about the LPs, can't have failure, innovation? Great question. Um, so a lot of things within Amazon are organic. Surprisingly, they really happen in organic. It's almost like an aha, uh -huh, or uh, if, well, that was obvious. We should have done that. Um, they can come from top down um, because leadership sees things, but they can come from bottom up as well. They can percolate through. We're a pretty flat organization. Um, you know, I used to get email, emails from Andy before he became president all the time. You know, he was telling me to do something, <laughs> more of. Um, so that it can be both, yeah. Um, we recently added two more that really um, came from sort of an outside um, understanding that we needed to focus on being the best employer in the world and that some of our environmental decisions really mattered. Um, those were outside influencers, I think. Um, but I think more so is these things become common narrative within the organization. I, I don't think that you can really um, implement them very f successfully if you don't create that common language. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, good. Other questions? Oh, good. I, I'm sorry. I can. I, you're right in the line of the light, so I couldn't see your hand. Yes. Uh, not real well. Is it on? Anyway, I'll just say. So you mentioned about single-threaded leaders. So how do you prevent creating more silos and stereotypes across the organization? Uh, great. How do you how do you prevent from creating more silos across the organization? Um. Hmm. So there's probably multiple answers to that. And I'm just going to give you Tom's perspective, is that we're a highly collaborative organization. Um, you don't have an environment where you're the single, there's no pride of ownership. Trust matters. Uh, earning trust really matters. You'll see that as one of our LPs. Um, so collaboration, communication, um, you'll find people ask a lot of questions of each other. I think that's an inherent thing of innovators and builders is that you're not going to know the single answer to everything. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I have to think on a little bit more. Give me a couple minutes and I'll probably have another answer for you. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh okay. the microphone. Go ahead. Sir. I don't know if it's working. but. Um, Related to that question, Amazon's done a, a number of high-profile acquisitions over the years. A lot of them were innovative companies like Ring and others. Uh, what, what's that experience been like? Because they had a different, maybe, innovation culture. Was that integrated within, shared throughout, or changed to meet your own? It's just curious. Wow. That's a big question. <laughs> and I'm a small guy. Not physically, obviously. <laughs> I wish I had the answer to that. You know, how, how did um, acquisitions affect culture from outside? I don't know that I would have experience with that. Um, so I don't know that I could answer that. But hang around. Maybe one of my colleagues has some thought. Um, Ben's been around for a long time. He may have some perspectives. But I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. At least not on a mic. <laughs> My question is similar. I would expect that people who come from other companies into yours probably have a sense of relief in many ways because a lot of bureaucracy and bullshit that they may be experiencing where they are is gone, but it's it's a radically different change. My my question is.
great question. So how do you, how do you deal with coming into an organization with this, like this, with such a strong culture that operates distinctly different from any place I've ever been? Um, we have a way of saying this, is that I feel like an imposter. <laughs> it took me well over a year to not feel like an imposter. Um, this is a fast-moving, innovative company that thinks really well. The smartest people in the world I've ever worked with are here, but it's because they're, they're, they're supported by these leadership principles about a, by a culture where your leadership, my leadership uses the LPs all the time. Um, we make decisions around those, and um, but it does take a while for you to get familiar with this, with this unique culture. But you have all the resources, the time you need, tons of training and development. But I think it's because we have a leadership that really um, applies the principles into the organization. They're not just placards on the wall. You know. yeah. Anyone else? Out there. Yes, sir. Uh, first, thanks for the presentation. Very informative. Sir? Uh, you, um, do you, do you get the feeling that happens to other large organizations that you all have a group that moves pretty much with their uh, culture of innovation, adapt and change in the way they're working? You're talking about customers that we've worked with, maybe? Customers or other, you know, other organizations that you've actually just observed in the wild over mm. time. Mm. Um, so, so the way that we do the working backwards process, the digital innovation workshops with customers, um, there's often sort of an aha for them as well along the way. So we start out, the first engagement is, first contact with the customer is at the C-suite where we do what's called an introduction. So we do an introduction to digital innovation um, it's typically about an hour. It's really level setting their expectations of where they're at, what they think about innovation, where they think about what their problems are, frustrations, pain points, and we describe the pro program to see if there's a fit. Um, that's pretty level setting. That's very generic. And then if there is a fit, we come back with what we call a frame the challenge. And um, these are wonderful to watch because you can see the light bulb kind of brighten. It's like a dimmer switch, and it gets brighter and brighter. A lot of times people enter into these and they say, these are my customers, these are my problems. But as you go through this process, um, it sometimes turns out that your customer's customer is really your customer. Um, or maybe um, you're you know, a, a captain of a, a, a battalion or commander of a battalion and uh, you're providing some kind of service and you realize, wow, that sysadmin turned out to really be my customer, not the four-star general. You know, that, uh, that the E4 you know, might be my, my customer. So that, and then working through the process, I think within public sector, and I come from a Fed, Civ, DOD background, and there are set pr processes for requirements development. Arduous. I probably made half of them. You know? um, but using our process really changes their understanding. It does take time. Um, but they do have an epiphany moment, and they get to solution quicker. So I can't call out a specific one right now. We're working with, we work with state, local, federal, nonprofit, nonprofit health, DOD. We have intel agencies we work with as well. Um, but in a generic answer, it's a process of learning and being willing to innovate with Amazon. Next question, sir. Yes, um, what can we use to find the problem? Right. 
Oh, what, um, what tools do you use to identify a customer's true problem versus what they think the problem and the solution is? Because many times you ask them, what is your problem? It might be A, but when you truly dive deep into it, it might be problem Z, and they might not even know that this, that's their true problem. Yeah, that happens all the time. Great question. You know, how do you find the real problem among, among the problems? <coughs> Pardon me. Um, we, we don't do workshops where the customer knows the solution. If you know the solution to your problem, you're, we're not the best fit for you. Um, so working back from that, a lot of times customers will say, oh, I know the problem. Um, but we're an iterative process. We're an exploratory process. We're experimental. The entire company operates under experimentation. Um, and it's not uncommon that we will end up with five to 10 problems um, that the customer might have. But using the working backwards process, we often find that as we move along and we get closer to understanding a solution, that solution answers multiple problems. And it becomes an issue of racking and stacking the priority of problems. You're still going to have a, <laughs> what organization is not going to have dozens of problems, right? It's just where do you begin? Which is the most important? And then as you go along, can you go back, iterate on that again? Remember the flywheel I talked about, iterate on that again restack those once you discover that, hey, we might actually be solving multiple problems here. That said, we try to keep very narrow. We try to you know, eat the elephant one bite at a time. Um, we can run multiple workshops, but let's try to run one, get one problem. What is the most important right now? Or if not one of the most important, what creates the greatest value? That's the trade-off. It may, may not be the most important right now, but it creates the most value, the highest impact. And then you can go back and take on the harder ones if you want. I don't know if I answer your question, but yeah. I see somebody had a hand way in the back. Sorry. Okay. Um, I think you may have partially answered this already, but you talked about you have the customer and the C-levels, and then maybe it's your sysadmin as the customer where they get this slow growing epiphany of the willing in the cultural transition. So we have difficulty in our cultural transition from one way to another. What about the unwilling or possibly apathetic? And what, how can we get them on board as well? Because that's our hardest part. <laughs> it is. The naysayers. Yes. Yeah. The roadblocks, inhibitors, yeah. Saboteurs. <laughs> yeah, we've all seen them, right? Um, they do exist. Um, <clears throat> that is why we don't do any engagements where the C-suite is not the decision maker. The C-suite, at the very first discussion, is with our account manager that's responsible, our leadership team, or our our digital innovation specialist, and the C-suite, preferably the CEO. They can say, these people stop showing up, you can get them back in the room. Right? We have to have leadership support. We actually won't go forward if leadership isn't fully committed. We lay out those expectations from the very beginning so that there's no uncertainty that the buck stops here. And uh, if we have naysayers, roadblocks, disruptors, that the C-suite can resolve those. Yeah, that's the, we just don't do them unless we have those commitments. Yeah. All right, where are we at? I love all these great questions. Okay. Program, we do partners as well. Yes. Yeah, reach out, we'll talk. Yeah. How do you, um establish uh, trust initially when you're going in for a consultation on the first time and you don't have the history yet to have built the trust? Because yeah. you've got to get the C-suite to open the kimono. 
but you need to have trust to do that. Yeah, how do you earn trust with um, the C-suite to even do this? So <clears throat> ours is a unique program, right, in that it is no cost, and we commit a lot of resources to it. We commit about 80 hours of our people's dedicated time to work on that customer or partner problem. We expect the customer to commit about 40 hours. It can shift, right? It, it, there's a lot of variations in that, but let's just start with that as a number. That's a lot of commitment, right? I mean, if, how many C-suite decision makers can be involved in something that long? Now, the initial engagement is C-suite. Uh, we will get into mid-level and, and more technical as we go along the workshop, but but even beginning, um, you have to qualify to use our program. Not everybody gets to do it. If you, this may not be a good fit for us. It may not be a good fit for the customer or, or the, the partner. Um, so that, that trust level um, begins almost before we even step in the room with the account manager and the customer already having a discussion. If there's some apprehension, a lot of times I'll go in and do one of these presentations to talk about, all right, you know, we don't know if this is a good fit. Do we want to partner with Amazon? I'll go and do a culture of innovation, you know, discussion unique to their environment that talks about kind of what we're talking about here um, and let them ask these kind of questions. If that's inspiring, it's interesting, we will then come back to that digit that introduction to digital innovation to see, are we on the same page? Are you committed? Are you a good fit? Are we a good fit for you before we even um, do it? We're, we're not attempting to convince a customer. If they don't want to do it, if it's not a perfect fit, we don't do it. All right. Any other questions? Wonderful, sir. Yeah, I'd, li I, I'd like to know how you guys deal when you have fierce competition. You had a fierce competition with Microsoft Azure for DOD. Initially, they won, but then they came back and awarded you guys apart. You normally say you deal with the C-suite, so you had to deal with their C-suite that consisted of a lot of people, not just a couple, you know, but then y'all came back and got a piece. How did you, what did you guys do to make the DOD change their mind and say, hey, we want you guys to be a part of it as well? Because initially, it was a complete loss. I'd like to know that. <laughs> so would I. <laughs> yeah, I and mean, I can't answer that. I don't know, honestly. Just I wasn't part of any of that. It's it's echelons beyond uh, my my decision cycles. Um, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't even be an expert on that. I don't even know how to do that work. But um, I wish I could answer it. I don't. I don't know the answer. I apologize. Yeah. Yeah. So I had another question. So you like the mechanisms yeah. and different ways of statistical decision making or maybe other examples and exercises? Are there, I guess, well, uh, besides just the ones on the website that are possibly in the leadership principles, is there anything specific that you would recommend that could be used by either, I don't know, Teams or C-suite or something like that? Help me understand the question a Sorry. little bit more. Uh, yeah, I talk kind of fast. Um, uh, uh, other mechanisms for, I guess, decision making uh. that you would recommend as you built an internal mechanism to solve a problem, but is there anything else of, say, a pairwise comparisons exercise that you would do with C-suite to determine their goals and objectives or determine their problems? Yeah, and I'd probably have to take more time to get into um, how we actually run the workshops, and that would be in the introduction to DI. But what I will say is we have, you, in the case of what I did, I created a mechanism, um, and many people do that. Um, and we have tool-based mechanisms that are consistent and have existed for a long time. But we actually have some really interesting reporting mechanisms. And everybody does you know, up-chain reporting, got it. But the way we do it is really, I think, quite valuable. And, and you know, if I was a, a C-suite decision maker, I would do my reporting just like Amazon's mechanism. So we have, depending upon what team you're on, weekly, 
biweekly, monthly, quarterly, annual reporting. And obviously at the annual, we, we reevaluate annual goals and objectives, uh, forecasting out the next year's uh, priorities, what are our operational priorities that we want to focus on. But at the more tactical level, um, our reporting is a comfortable mechanism. So it's nothing more than a two by two. We all do them, right? But they include what are my problems? What are my successes? Where are my opportunities? What's working? What's not working? What are my metrics? And do my metrics match? We're going through this struggle right now. We're reevaluating our mechanisms. I got a great boss over here. She thinks differently about um, metrics. And she thinks and says, does this, does this metric really have to be collected? Does it really have to be reported? Does it really provide value? And that challenged me at first. And I had been entrenched for like a year or more in these are my metrics, and this is how we're supposed to do it. And that's you know, not made here. She came in and said, it's you know, different. And so it took me a while to, you know, I, I talk about do I live with clinched fists or do I have an open hand? And, and living with an open hand and being able to change. And so she really forced us to dive deep, applied the leadership principles, dove deep on our metrics, and we're reevaluating all of them now. And they're getting really good, like real things that we can measure that have real consequences to how we are being customer obsessed. Not just saying customer obsessed, but can we measure that in a real constructive way and it's required me to actually go back and learn new reporting tools. How do I access different data that I never really had to do? I assumed that we had everything right. Um, in hindsight, we could have done better, and we're going to. We're getting there. Yeah. It's kind of cool. It's stressful, though. But, you know, the home decks have their cheese moved, right? So. Hey. Um, so you talked about failure, uh, experimentation, and you mentioned that the people that helped uh, develop the Fire Phone went on to go develop the Amazon Alexa and Echo. Those are products, types, that weren't really on the market before then, and there was a time of transition between that. Did you allow the hardware team to kind of experiment or do like pro uh, customer research in order to reach that time? Like, so what did the hardware team kind of do in that time of transition? Uh -huh. Well, I'm not on the hardware team, so I don't know that I would know that specific answer, and I've not worked with them. But what I can say, this is probably not a direct answer, is that I'm aware that we experiment on a lot of products that never go to market, because I see the emails. I see what those are. Um, within, when you're in Amazon, you, you get the opportunity to become a tester of new products and services that might be coming online. It could be a small change to Alexa or a small change to the website, but it can also be a whole product. Um, and I actually got one of those for a really, really cool product. Um, my wife said, no way, you're not putting that thing in our house. <laughs> I said, honey, this is really cool. You gotta see this thing. And uh, I actually just this morning saw a website that showed an example of it, apparently we did a press release where we announced um, that there is a Ring Home drone that's going to be released. Yeah, it's probably going right in the head like, yeah. Yeah, my wife was like, no. <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty cool. And I knew about that um, just because I could volunteer. But I don't know the product side and how they make decisions. But I knew that we see kind of things that never make it to market and sometimes Drones making a market, and that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. All right, I think Hi. we're wrapping up. Have somebody else? I, I have one more question. Hi, my name is Simon. I'd um, like to know about the distribution and replication of the culture of innovation globally. Like from, from my experience, we're interacting a lot more with Amazon in India. Um, how do you approach that replication oh, and distribution of culture of innovation around the world? Oh, excellent, because I'm going to actually pump that question to someone, but I'm going to start the question. I'm going to let Ben take the mic from you. Ben's right in front of you. That's distribution, oh. thanks. <laughs> yeah, no. Pass it to Ben Butler right there. But Ben, I'm going to start the question for you. So my role um, 
in Amazon, your role is going to change. Like you're going to invent things and you're going to change your role. That's just what you do. But my role um, initially was, and, and to some degree still is, very much the, the program manager for all public sector globally for digital innovation. So we have a team in Australia, New Zealand, India, EMEA, UK, we have folks in Germany, whatever, all over globally. And it would be really shocking for most people to see how successful their cultural communication occurs. Um, it is really amazing to work globally, to, to know that the LPs actually translate pretty well globally um, because everybody uses them. All my teams globally use them. But my boss over here, Ben Butler, um, is the lead for all cloud innovation centers, KICS, and digital innovation as well. Um, and so he probably has a great perspective on this. Can you answer, Ben? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tom. Hi, everyone. So there's a couple ways I'd like to answer your question. One is the program I run. It's a way to go to market and work with customers to share the culture of innovation and use the culture to solve their problems. But I think your question was more about how does Amazon do it globally, specifically in India. So we do have an innovation center in India. But one thing to also note within Amazon, everyone is a steward and a practitioner of the culture of innovation. So it is, we say we're a flat organization, everyone is inspired and actually expected to be an innovator and a builder and to also exhibit those leadership principles and to maintain that culture. As also as a manager and a leader, you're supposed to coach and mentor your staff with the culture of innovation, and that's globally. One of the slides that, sh when Tom showed the leadership principles, it's uh, one of my favorite slides. It needs to be a little bit updated with those two new yeah. leadership principles that we just released, but it's a double helix. It's DNA. So we're in all these different countries. When I first started Amazon 10 years ago, it was 65,000 people in, as employees. We're now at 1.3 million in the 10 years since I've been. And to grow that way and to maintain a, a, a common culture, those leadership principles are foundational as well as expected for everyone to carry them forward because it is it's the core. So we have different backgrounds, different languages, different cultures, but the common core DNA of Amazon is, is those leadership principles to be able to do it. So, so one aspect is we have a global innovation center to help others innovate, and that's mostly customer facing. But then internally within Amazon's culture of innovation, everyone takes the flag and, and, and goes forward with it, and they're expected to adhere to that culture. And I think there was another question about, well, if you um, acquire another company, what happens in, the, you know, like Tom, I'm not experienced a merger and acquisition, but I've, throughout my relationships, I've worked with other people in different parts of Amazon. But over time, uh, the people who stay on through that acquisition adhere to the culture because that's what, you know, most people join Amazon because they believe in it and they want to be a part of that type of um, uh, 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 group of people that exhibit those leadership principles. So hopefully that answers your question. Excellent. Thanks, Ben. So that's the end. My, uh, I'm getting the hook. My clock has run out. Um, if you have any additional questions, I'll hang around for a while. I don't know if someone's in this room afterwards. If so, we can chat outside, and myself or someone from the team can answer. Thanks, everyone.